Hello everyone and welcome, welcome everybody. We've just been waiting for folk to come in through the door. I'd just like to say, Salam Aleikum, Falche Gudanijan. I'd like to say welcome to you all. I'd like to say Bienvenue on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and this live event, um, live and live recording event from uh, the Young Academy of Scotland and from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It's absolutely wonderful to have you all here and um, part of this event and to also be able to welcome our extraordinary panel of speakers. Um, just a few things to note as we get started. My name is Alison Phipps. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I am UNESCO chair at the University of Glasgow for refugee integration through languages and the arts. And um, we have with us our distinguished speakers. We have artist Ian Campbell, Pinar Aksu, who's development officer at Mary Hill Integration Network, Shauki Al Dubai, partnership development leader at the University of Strathclyde, uh, Ala Hamdan, lecturer in structural geology at Mosul University, Deborah Kayembi, a lawyer, linguist, and human rights campaigner, and Zaza Al Bakua, who's a PhD candidate in biomedical sciences at the University of Aberdeen. Um, a little bit of background information before we start. You can see us, but sadly we can't see you. But we would love it if you can use the chat function. Maybe let us know where you are in the world, where you're listening in from. It would be great to know. So do use the chat function. And as we go through this hour and a half of time together, if you have questions, then do put those into the chat and we'll be able to monitor those. Um, and um, also, as we start, particularly to say thanks to um, Nazia Khan and also to Hannah Bentley from the Royal Society of Edinburgh and to the Young Academy of Scotland for putting this together and for dealing with all of the logistics behind the scene. As I'm sure you're aware from um, this new age of Zoom, we are um, having many different logistical um, issues that we have to deal with and think about. It may well be that our, um, our bandwidth goes down or data needs to switch on phones and we just ask you to bear with us um, as we navigate that with our participants and with our panelists as well. And just so you know, my partner upstairs, he's been told to keep his camera off just so that we can try and keep a really nice stream on the live feed and also on the recording. So maybe to give you a little bit of background to this, um, in 2016, um, the Young Academy of Scotland launched its at-risk academic refugees initiative to recognise talented young professionals from Scotland's refugee and displaced migrant communities. This initiative provided encouragement to all of us and especially to outstanding members of the refugee and displaced migrant communities to apply to YAS and to, pro to provide them with support with their applications. And YAS is today proud to include seven RR members in its cohort. And the Royal Society of Ed Edinburgh, the fellowship is especially proud of what this represents and of all that we as fellows have learned from these seven RR members. Um, in 2019, the Royal Society of Edinburgh commissioned Glasgow-based portrait painter E.I.D. Campbell, Ian Campbell, to produce portraits of five Yas Ara members and to celebrate their involvement with the Royal Society of Edinburgh and to raise their profiles. And so this talk will bring the five Ara members and I.D. Campbell together again for an in-depth discussion that aims to raise awareness of Scotland's refugee and displaced migrant communities how these in, uh, individuals have established themselves worldwide as new Scots and how they're now contributing in many different ways to the well-being and prosperity of Scotland, how COVID has impacted their lives and their communities in particular, and um, how they have experienced the um, strange uh, 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 experience, if you like, of sitting and being the subjects of uh, a portrait and going through that process very closely overall with um, 
with Ian and with the, with the project group. Um, just to give you an overview of the event, each speaker will give a short seven minute talk followed by um, a Q&A uh, with the audience after the talks have co concluded. And the event is due to end at three o'clock. And also just to say that several of our members are in really great demand and it may be that one or two of them step out for a moment from the panel and then step back in um, should they need to take a call at some point. And we're all getting very used to this um, with this new online environment. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ian Campbell to you. Um, I.D. Campbell is a Glasgow-based portrait painter and affiliate artist of the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration through Languages and the Arts with myself at the University of Glasgow. Between 2016 and 2019, he was artist in residence at St George's Tron Church of Scotland in Glasgow. Ian's best known for his painting, Our Last Supper, featuring 13 guests of Glasgow City Mission. And he's also painted for Christian Aid, the World Council of Churches and Tia Fund. In 2020, he will be working in partnership with Remembering Srebrenica Scotland on paintings for the 25th anniversary of Srebrenica. His work focuses on bold portraits, exploring life in the face of adversity. Um, Ian, might I hand over to you for your seven minute talk? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Do you know, painting uh, for the Royal Society of Edinburgh is quite daunting, to be perfectly honest. Uh, th the Society's been around for a long, long time. Uh, I think it was, it was 1783 it was, uh, it was founded. Um, and, you know, Going way, way back, they had people like Sir Walter Scott, who's got a big statue in the middle of Edinburgh. Um, people like him got painted and they've got royalty that were painted. Uh, and before I'd, I got to do these paintings, the last time they commissioned um, some portraits, I think it was in 2016, uh, very renowned Scottish artist, Victoria Crow had had been asked to do two portraits. One of them was uh, Professor Peter Higgs of Higgs Boson fame. Uh, and also um, the, the outgoing uh, RSE president, Professor Dame uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, and I think that was actually the first time a woman had been painted uh, for, for the RSE, uh, which is, is really interesting. You know, there's such a deep history with this organization. Um, but then, you know, daunting enough to be painting portraits for the RSE, but then is painting portraits of these folk. Um, and I was aware of the, the weight of history, uh, getting involved in, in, a, in a project like this. And I knew it in the back of my head, but it was only when when I, uh, when I got to meet Deborah uh, for the first time. Uh, De Deborah uh, is someone who has absolutely loved going into the, the George Street HQ of uh, the Royal Society and, and seeing all those portraits. And she told me she was really quite in awe of seeing all these people with the great things that they'd done in the past. And she said to me out loud what I'd thought in the back of my head, I will be the first black face on those walls. And that's quite daunting for me to, to, to be the one bringing that piece of history in there. Um, and, and also uh, with painting Deborah and Pinar, I think I got to treble the number of paintings of women. Uh, that are there in the Royal Society, which is fantastic. Um, it was, I think, mostly for me, it was so exciting to see uh, an organisation like the Royal Society of Edinburgh, so steeped in history, pointing the way forward into, uh, into the future for Scottish society, saying, you know, we know, we acknowledge all, all the wonderful things that people in Scotland have done now, here we go, here are people uh, who are uh, in Scotland now and, and we are 
so excited to see them doing um, great things uh, in, in, this, in this country. Um, I, I got to uh, painting Pinar and painting Shoki. I, I got to meet up with them in Glasgow. They, they both live here, as do I. I'm here in, uh, in my studio, which is in my house. I've got this ridiculously big townhouse in, in Govan, so we, we were able to turn uh, one of the rooms into an art studio, which is fantastic. Uh, and, and been really glad over lockdown to have this space to work in. Lots of artists uh, haven't had access to their studios for for quite some time uh, right at the start especially uh, so meeting up with them was was really easy nipped over to edinburgh to see uh deborah uh, drove up to aberdeen to see zahir um and then uh th there was a few other folks that i didn't think we were going to get to include but then i got a message to say oh Allah who had moved back to Mosul, um, he's actually coming over to the, the UK. Um, we were able to arrange meeting up uh, in Liverpool. Uh, I'd never been to Liverpool before, so got to drive down there and see the land of the Beatles uh, and, and get to meet this fantastic man and, and, and got to paint him. Um, since since then, uh, you know, we've obviously we've we've had lockdown. It's been a challenging, challenging situation. Uh, I, I I was able to do the paintings for remembering Srebrenica uh, for the twenty fifth anniversary of the the genocide, which was in, in July. Uh, but of course, there was a number of projects that got cancelled. Uh, some things um, postponed. Uh, COP26, which should be should have been in November originally, um, it has been shifted a, a full year, and I'll be doing some some work for that. Uh, I've got to focus on um, uh, on our, our children quite a lot, uh, who who were at home so much over the summer, uh, and, and I'm I'm also able to get uh, some work ready for a group exhibition that's coming up. Uh, postponed a, num a number of times about getting to work alongside Joe Lomo and Alan Wilson and a few other folks like that. Um, but it's uh, I'm so I'm so excited to to be here today and, and to get to see all these folks again uh, who I've met before and painted. Really exciting. Thanks so much, Ian. That's really fascinating. And also just thinking about the the, the, the challenge that you had whilst painting of you know that that story that I've heard you tell before having the chance to actually um, go down and meet Allah so you could actually do that work it's just lovely to get an insight into that but also what it's meant for you over the last little while of painting at home and painting from home um, so we're going to move on to the first of um, our young academicians and um, refugee background scholars. And I'm going to hand over to you, Zaha. So, Zaha is a pharmacologist currently doing a PhD in cardiovascular vascular diseases in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, and yeah. alongside his biomedical research, he has three years' experience in managing pharmaceutical quality control laboratories. So Zaha, over to you to tell us a little bit more about your work and your life. Yeah, thank you very much. I will just share uh, my some, some slides. Thank you very much. I would like, uh, thank you very much. I would like just to share a little bit my life here. And I am, I am currently a PhD student at the University of Aberdeen. And, and every time I present, I present something like that, I always, I always start with saying you are the hope with where no hope exists. So it belongs to everyone here, everyone, everyone in Scotland and everyone in the UK, because at some point I had no hope and a hand uh, took me out of, out, out of where I was and then gave me all the hope back and all my life back now. So I will just just give a brief a brief history about 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 what, what I mean where I came from and and my life there just to sh give you the, where I am right now and the shift that I've had uh, so far. So this is my my city uh, Aleppo just before the war in 2010 and as you can see it's a lovely city. It's buzzing with life and everything is great. And this is our life basically. So uh, this is our this is some pictures from me and my friends uh, uh, and our in our life moments we have got but the picture in the middle is the one that means a lot to me because there was uh, there was where 
uh, my closest friends and I took the picture of them and I it means a lot to me for one reason that every one of them is now in a different country and and probably we won't be able to take the same picture at any point later on and that was due to the fact that the war started in Aleppo and that is how the city uh, looks like and then how 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 everything changed in 2012 and 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 everything everything in Aleppo was kind of uh, under risk of Everywhere in Aleppo was was under risk of being targeted by 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 bombs, by 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 by, by snipers, by anything basically. But just to review a sense of how it feels like being there, just before I move and shift to how my life is now, so that I can show uh, the huge difference. So this is one of the streets in Aleppo, and 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 my flat was kind of in a similar area. But like what I experienced that I experienced living in that flat and and there is a fight going outside uh, between between the groups and 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 just to give you a sense of how that feels I would I would gently ask every one of you if you can just uh, close your eyes and listen to this short audio that I will play at the moment so this is how it feels like if there is a fight outside where we you live at the moment. So that is that is one one memory that I, I will never ever forget in my whole life. Spending nights just uh, being hiding from from the from from the fights that are going outside and wishing that everything will be fine and and you will you will be safe. But like another another thing, I was working at this you know at at this at this at this pharmaceutical company and I was after my graduation I managed to get a job there. But I will share with you again. Another memory that I had over there while there is while we were all waiting for a, a missile being dropped by air forces, we all we all we all were lying on the floor, putting our hands on the top of our heads and wishing that that missile is not going to be on the building where we are working. So I was working in the building in the building that's in the middle. And just to give you again a sense of how it feels like when you are hiding there and there is a poem coming coming from air forces towards you so if you if you would ask i would ask gently ask everyone again just to listen to this please So these, these, these are kind of the two memories I will never ever forget. And, and actually the positive side of it, it just helps me to overcome most of the challenges that I faced during my life because, because anything else could be a little bit easier than going through that. But like, just to now to go to the like bright side of the story when it comes, when it came basically from the UK, the UK and Scotland in particular, the University of Aberdeen with the help of the Council for Atrocity Academics, they took me out of all that. And, and it, was, it was very easy process for them to take me when, when, they, when, they, when they realized that I was at risk and I needed help. And I found it only here after I, I seeked help in all, in all over the world, to be honest. So, so I, would, I would like to say that it's with love of the Scottish people with their support and with their with their sympathy I mean I managed to settle in the UK and 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 I never I never I never I never felt that I left home basically I feel I have now a big family right here to which I will be grateful for the rest of my whole life and and as you can see my life now it's it's buzzing with different with uh, 
with different events. I've been volunteering with, uh, with, with different events uh, and public engagement events to raise awareness about what we do and for presenting my work at conferences and taking part in science day with the school with children, attending uh, birthday parties and, and, and getting prizes and being a member of the Young Academy of Scotland. And all of that, it's just like was managed. I managed to go all through this with the help of everyone here. I know that every time I need help, I will always find it. And I always, find, always remember that the other options I could have had were just being tracked to be to to be fighting fighting with one of the groups or if I want to escape that I will be hiding somewhere uh, escaping the risk or I will be uh, refuge I will see or I would seek refuge in one of the refugee camps where which means that your whole life is just stopped but it's not it's not only me who settled here, it's just my baby as well, who is now settled. And it's not, it's not just me, I am so grateful. It's all, again, my baby is so grateful. At least when I go to work, I know my baby is safe and she is playing and she is waiting for me and she is expecting me to come back. So that is priceless. And, and, with, and I believe that being here, even with the pandemic, uh, the, the, the people here have managed to help me to settle and complete my life and achieve what I really want. So whatever I say, I would, I would like to say to conclude by thanks to the moon and back and, and, and you are just amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Zaha. I'm sure everyone is, is very moved by the story, but also by the gentleness and compassion with which you've been presenting that. And um, I know that people will want to send their love and best wishes to the whole of your family and especially your beautiful daughter. Um, and I, I was really moved by the sounds. Um, the sounds that are familiar to me, both from time I've spent in Syria and time I've spent in the Gaza Strip. And once you've heard those sounds and you aren't thinking this is just another plane at Glasgow airport and you actually realize what it means, it does strange things to your body. So I think you know the, the choice of your future career as well with pharmacology is really interesting. And um, we're just delighted that you've been able to join and been able to share your experiences through CARA, through YAS and through being with us today. Thank you so much there for calling us, for doing us the honor of calling us your Scottish family. We're really grateful to you too. Um, I'm going to move on now to our next um, uh, panel member and um, young academician, um, Pinar Aksu. Um, and Pinar is a human rights activist. She's development officer at Mary Hill Integration Network and also a theater maker. Um, and she works coordinating projects for welcoming asylum seekers and refugees in the community and as a facilitator with active inquiry in Edinburgh. Um, Pinar has been campaigning to raise awareness of the issues asylum seekers and refugees face um, and is involved with anti-racism and human rights movements. Um, she's also listed on the um, 30 under 30 young women's movement list and was recently awarded one of the Amnesty International Brave Awards for 2020 for Scotland. Um, I've known Pinar since she was 16 and um, know that she really is quite an indefatigable campaigner, but also brings with it a gentleness and a sense of humor. Pinar, we're looking forward to hearing from you for the next um, seven minutes. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, uh, thanks for your kind words, um, Alison. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, but I am all grown up now, so it's, it's, it's working on that. <laughs> um, if my internet does cut off at any point, please let me know because it's not that great at the moment. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be in this panel. I mean, it's really um, great to be part of this group and also to hear so many experiences and expertise that we all bring um, with us um, in this platform. Um, as you've said, um, at the moment, I work with an integration network and what I thought would be beneficial and useful today would be to raise awareness about what has been going on um, since, uh, since the pandemic started in Glasgow and Scotland and UK generally about um, people who are seeking asylum and refuge and what they faced. Um, as part of our work, um, we had to adjust and shift 
the, the sort of work and support we have been carrying out. And one of the important thing that uh, we have seen was in March when the pandemic started, the removal of uh, people seeking asylum into hotel accommodation, uh, the people who were already in accommodation places where they already had a safe place. Um, and this was absolutely shocking for all of us, uh, for all the campaigners, but also for all the organizations, because uh, you know we were advised to stay at home, we were advised that uh, going outside, sharing, uh, in, especially around platforms uh, where you might be sharing things is, is not good. Um, and then we had seen about 400 people uh, moved from their accommodation into hotels across the city in, uh, in, in Glasgow. And um, this was um, seen as an outrageous decision by the Home Office and by mayors. Uh, uh, by campaigners and organizations, like I said, and we were really extremely worried about the well-being of the people who were moved into hotels. Um, and sadly, um, this whole thing escalated in May when one of the person who was staying in the hotels was um, has passed away. Um, and this raised issues around why people were moved from their accommodation into hotels in the first place. Um, what was the safety or behind when mo moving the people? Um, and could this have been avoided um, if people were not moved with a, a, a life um, have not passed away um, and we we feel like we are when I say we I mean I mean the organizations and the campaigners um, and also I would say the people of Glasgow as well and Scotland we felt that this uh, this treatment should stop um, and sadly um, things again got escalated and then we had the park and the hotel incident which became very famous actually across uh, across the country and globally um, where P where um, one of the person who was staying in, inside the hotel um, um, you know uh, s s stabbed uh, a few other um, members who were staying in the hotel and also staff as well um, and again we were the, the way that the whole story got treated was um, very interesting in terms of um, being portrayed in the media, um, especially in a city as Glasgow, where you have nice, uh, sorry, where you have knife crimes um, happening um, on on occasion, the way that this news piece was reported um, was uh, highlighting the discrimination and the racism that we have in the media, um, where certain news uh, is reported differently depending on the person's immigration status and the, the skin, the color of their skin. Um, and sadly, um, a few months later, again, we've seen someone else who uh, passed away as well. Um, we've seen um, that a mother um, um, who's called um, Mercy, who, who passed away. Um, although, again, it needs to be looked into um, the reasons behind it. Um, all the stories and all these incidents highlight the need for a humane, um, immigration system. It highlights the need to reassess what people are going through, what people are faced when they are, have been moved into the communities and also when, when they have been uh, moved out of their accommodation. Um, and at the end of the day, when we look at it, it's the people who are seeking asylum and refuge who, who, who are continuing to suffer. And during COVID-19, I think it highlighted the inequality that people uh, face and uh, the inequality we have um, within the immigration system. And especially, we need to look at what we can do in Scotland. Obviously, uh, we have a wide range of organizations and people um, trying to make communities a better and safer place. But I feel like we can do more, uh, we can challenge more, um, and we can actually start thinking about what, what sort of an immigration system we can have in future, um, such as if Scotland does become independent, um, what would happen? What kind of immigration system we want uh, to see in, within our communities? And at the moment, um, there are sadly uh, some people who are still um, being, uh, who are still in the hotel accommodation um, and they have not been moved into their own accommodation. Um, when I mean by people, again, I mean people who are seeking asylum and refuge. Um, as I mentioned, the issues for people continue, not having the right to work is a really important aspect. Um, 
Uh, we've seen that during COVID-19, everybody struggled, you know, everyone is, is impacted on everyone's lives. However, the minimum support that people get, the asylum support, which is around 30, 37 pounds a week now, is not helping anyone. And actually people want to um, work and contribute to their communities and also um, to the country as well, you know, they pay their taxes, um, also use their skills and experiences uh, in, in their profession. Um, yeah. I would like to just end by saying that there is a lot of things that we need to do in terms of making the communities a welcoming space, but also understanding different reasons why people move and migrate and seek asylum and refuge, and that everyone's story is um, different to each other. And when we are assessing people's uh, claim, uh, we should be basing that on, uh, on humanity, on human rights, and concentrating on that aspect uh, of seeking a sanctuary and asylum. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pinar. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And um, Pinar has been absolutely vital within the city of Glasgow in the work that she does, both in organizing campaigns for human rights, but particularly around many of the, the deliveries that many different organizations have been coordinating in the city of Glasgow. Um, and she's one of my go-to people for just understanding what the situation is like and what the experience is like for those people who are also involved in humanitarian relief in the city of Glasgow and in other parts of the country, um, as well as having survived detention and um, the asylum system themselves. So Pinar, for all that you do, we thank you. We're really grateful to the way that you engage with these questions and that you you don't sit back, you don't um, wait, you are continuing to engage and think intelligently about what is needed for, um, for the present, present day. Um, I'm now going to pass on to our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is um, Dr. Shauki al Dubai. So um, Shauki, if you want to um, put your camera on, if that works, and maybe unmute, and I'll just introduce you. Um, so Shauki, um, Shauki holds a BEng in computer technology, an MSc in computer engineering, an MBA in IT, and a PhD in computer engineering. So he's already, I think, got three more degrees than I have. <laughs> um, he currently works as partnership development leader in the digital manufacturing team, Advanced Forming Research Centre, National Manufacturing Institute in Scotland at the University of Strathclyde. So I'm waving from Glasgow down the hill at you, Shauki. And he's an AFRC representative on manufacturing digital innovation hubs that support the AFRC to establish a Scottish regional manufacturing digital innovation hub in Scotland. He works as a teaching assistant and also as an honorary research associate at the School of Computing Science with my colleagues at the University of Glasgow. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, he's worked with National Manufacturing Institute Scotland business development team. He's worked with the Scottish Government and with the National Health Service Scotland. Shauki, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you for your giving me this opportunity and thank you for you also and for Ian. Uh, yes, I'm Shauki Dubai. I arrived in Scotland from Yemen in uh, 2015, I mean, two, uh, sorry, 2015. And I wanted to make contact with organizations and people I thought would be helpful to start me in an academic position because I came from the academic position. So I contacted Cara and after a few months, it was clear that they would not be able to support me. And I had to start from scratch and I got most of the help and support from the Scottish people and non-profit organizations. So thank you for that, for you, especially the Scottish people. Uh, in uh, 2016, I saw on the Refugee Council website that Young Academy of Scotland had published at risk academic and, uh, and refugees initiative. So I applied and I got it. It was the first interview I passed at that time. And it, it gave me, I mean, like motivation to, to continue. At the same time, I wanted to start integrating, make links with the local community and establish that side of my life too. I joined several organizations as 
affluent here, such as Asylum Seeker Housing Project, Scottish Review Council, Forest City Commission, and yes, absolutely, should be there. I started attending the International Welcome Club in Wellington Church. This helped me with different things and made Scottish friends who helped me to settle in. For example, Liz Deviston, Carol, Grace, and Joel Yates. Other were Jim uh, Gip, uh, I mean, sorry for the, the name, Jim Dribbins, who helped me to pass the driving test. Thank you, Jim. All that is important because I was here alone at that time. The Scottish, I mean, the Scottish people say we are all Joe Thompson bears. And that's what I, I mean, that's what I, what I have seen, to be honest. Yes, help me to return to the academic environment and give me references to apply for academic positions. For example, Dr. Carey, Prof. Girls, Kate, and Mary, and the other team in the initiative, in this, in, I mean, in uh, the RR initiative. I attended events organized by YAS and MAIT, YAS members. One of them became a mentor to help me with job applications and references. Global Young Academy also helped me, especially Dr. Martin. Thank you, Dr. Martin from the University of, uh, of uh, St. Andrews. Prof. German at the University of Glasgow, he was the kindest person. My journey was very hard without these people. It would be a lot more difficult. I attended many workshops through YAS, Global Young Academy, and European Commission. And thank you for the European Commission also. I volunteered at the University of Glasgow as an honorary research associate to rebuild my CV and understand the UK system. It was very difficult system to be honest, and it is competitive, extremely competitive. Finally, I got the first job at the University of Glasgow at, I mean, as a teaching assistant, or I can say marking assistant that time. And it was the big, I mean, it was the first job in the Glasgow University. And that was also, I mean, the first time I apply and I got it, that I was lucky for that. Before that, I did many interviews and I did not get that, I mean, uh, the jobs, what I applied, unfortunately, because as I say it is so difficult to get it. By now, my family, my wife, and four children were with me in Scotland. Thanks for the British Red Cross in that case. I needed to have a permanent post. Eventually, I did get a longer term, two years contract at the University of Stride Fight where I'm now, so it is my opportunity to prove myself. I'm now, uh, I mean, but, or but it was a long journey to be there applying for lots of work. I'm currently representing the University of Strathclyde in EU project to establish Scottish Regional Manufacturing Digital Innovation Hub, as she, as Alison said. Regarding COVID, uh, I mean, re regarding COVID situation, for shortly, I, it has not impacted me too much, except that my indefinite leave to remain was delayed. I can work from home easily as my work is computer-based. As I said, I have four children and they were not at school during uh, the big lockdown in the spring. They were giving lessons from the school and the weather was very good, but we couldn't go anywhere, but they could play outside. The bandy, I mean, the, the, the pandemic uh, has affected the wider asylum seekers and refugees community more than me, because services have, uh, have been delayed. For example, housing, hearings, also ESOL courses have moved online. And many asylum seekers and refugees don't get access to Wi-Fi or laptops. This has caused people a lot of stress. During COVID-19 pandemic, I worked as part of my team in the University of Strathclyde, as Alison said, especially National Manufacturing Scotland Business Development Team to help NHS, uh, I mean, NHS of Scotland connect with companies who were offering services to support NHS response to COVID-19 
19 situation, our efforts were mentioned in the speech in the Scottish Parliament by Mr. Ivan Mackey, MSP. I'm, I'm abroad for that. Now I'm grateful to be a new Scot, and I hope I will make a good contribution to the Scottish people. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shauki. I think everyone probably feels tired just listening to all the different ways in which you have tried to make a life for yourself here. And also equally grateful to the people that you've been naming, all the organizations you've been naming, but also the individuals, both the academics, but also the folk just down the road from where I'm broadcasting from, um, are, uh, from Wellington Church's um, famous uh, English language club and all the people there. Um, and I was smiling as I was thinking of all those kind people and the work that they do, um, but also thinking of how lucky they've been to have you and your determination um, and how wonderful it is to know that you also have your four children um, too and that they are growing up with you um, at the moment. So we want to thank you very much and thank you for all you've been doing around digital inclusion and digital justice for all in Scotland as part of an inclusive society. You've really highlighted something important and it's important we have people like yourself who can really understand what those issues are when we're working with digital technology. So thank you, Shauki. And I'm sure there are many themes already starting to emerge around the welcome, around integration, around the hard work it is, around the organizations, people in the chat who are just asking, what can we do to help? Or how might you help me? How can we find out more? So really grateful already to um, Zahir, Pinar, Shauki for what they've brought to this, um, this conversation. Um, I'm now going to move on, thank you Shauki, and invite Deborah Kayembi to unmute her mic and to um, put on her video. Um, so Deborah Kayembi joined the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Bienvenue Deborah. Um, Deborah Kayembi joined the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Young Academy of Scotland in 2016, one of the first cohort. And Ian has just mentioned that on the 13th of August 2019, Deborah became the first African citizen to have her portrait displayed on the walls of the RSE. And I think you can all tell my voice is catching um, because it moves me deeply that this should have happened. Following this event, the Universal Peace Federation International um, um, Office in the Democratic Republic of Congo appointed Deborah as an ambassador for peace on Saturday, the 14th of September, 2019. Deborah has devoted her life to campaigning for human rights and advocating against racism, inequality, children in need domestic violence, child abuse, and issues of refugees and migrants. And for more than a decade, she's campaigned for a better world where every human being is treated with respect, regardless of the color of their skin, gender, or place of birth. And she's just going to talk for around seven minutes about her work at the moment, and maybe some of her more recent campaigning as well around inclusion of African history in the Scottish curriculum, which is a live campaign she's involved in at the moment. Deborah, over to you. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to start with Ian Camber because I think he mentioned something very difficult for, um, for me to realize until this day that uh, I am the, so far, the only black face on the whole of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I remember when uh, Alison gave me the, this phone call, I, I was at my kitchen and the phone rings and I, there's a text message from Alison. I said, what does she want again this time? And she said, do you want me, do you want to have a portrait for you? And I immediately I said, that's exciting. And I, oh yes, 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 yes. And then when I, I finished and I said, what is this portrait about? Oh, Alison, oh, Alison, oh, Alison. Always asking me very difficult things. What am I gonna do with this portrait? And very quickly, I received this uh, email, email from Ian said, I'm coming to your home for, to work on the portrait. Ay, 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 ay. And I keep saying myself on that day, they kidding me? All these huge people on that hall of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and they put me in the middle. <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. So my 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 feeling at that time was that I was scared 
not to be at the level of those people already on those paintings there, because these are huge people, these are people standing for what they've done for this land, Scotland. So Ian arrived and I did not want to make any makeup. I did not to dress myself. I did not want to make, dress myself. I wanted Ian to captive, not the face of Deborah Kayembe, but the inner Deborah Kayembe, which represent so many African journey to a different land, to Scotland. I wanted this portrait to, re to represent the hardship, the struggle, but in the midst of those hardship and struggle, I want, I wanted Ian to, to show the dignity that in which I'm still standing for who I am, because who we are, it's who we were. It's exactly that and nothing else. So that, that's the portrait. And every time somebody give me a bit of feedback and I, I want to congratulate Ian here. I, I'm one of the big fans of Ian about his portrait. I, I, it's not because it's about me, but I think the best portrait that Ian has never made is my portrait. And if today there is a, 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 a in New York there, they want to sell, <laughs> they want to sell a Royal Society of Edinburgh portrait. Mine is going to be $10 million. I swear to you, just try the exercise. So I'm hoping the Royal Society of Edinburgh understand the message here. If you want to make money, just put Deborah Kayembe up there. You see how much money you're going to make. That's for sure. Now, uh, COVID. COVID is a pandemic. And during March, we went, we went on lockdown. And three weeks after the lockdown, I become ill. But I went to breathing difficulties and those breathing difficulties made the doctor understood that I needed to be, I needed to be sent to the COVID ward. So I was on COVID ward on the day of the killing of George Floyd. So I was not really knowing what was happening around the world. All these protests on the street, I could not see them because I was in hospital, I was being treated. After seven days, the conclusion came that I did not have COVID, but it was a mysterious illness. And for that illness, I was supposed to be home and self-isolated for a further 14 days. That take me to June, <laughs> where for the first time after several weeks, I managed to get out from my home and get to my car when I then realized my car was sabotaged by racist. Nail was put in my car on the purpose to, for, for me to get to an accident and to get killed. That gave me a wake up call. I don't want anyone to get me wrong here. I love Scotland. This is the place I came to find peace and dignity. I work hardless, harshly for justice in this country. But when something is not right in our society, we need to talk about it and we need to fix it. We have the pandemic of COVID, but we have another pandemic and that pandemic is racism. And if we continue to say that everything is fine to Scotland, welcome to Scotland, everything is fine to Scotland, we are hurting ourselves. These people, those, those are committing racist crime, a con, or making a um, plan to, to hurt people because the color of the skin or their religion are the minorities, but they are hurting. That's why I'm standing with the Freedom Work campaign to campaign against racism in this country. And the only way I think we can campaign against it is to go to higher education. I now file a petition with the public committee of this, the, the Scottish Parliament, register under the registration number PP32222. Remember this number, PPP3222 is the first ever anti-racist bill in, within Scottish education. We have a long way to go, we'll get there. But once we get there, we build a country that is the best country that we never, we never had in Europe. Our children will learn to respect each other in their classroom so they can talk to their parents. What you told me many years ago was wrong because at school, they told me what is right. We don't have any other way. This is the only way. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I think everyone can tell the energy, the determination, and also the sense of humor um, that Deborah has. And she brings this to all of her work, you know, whether she's working as a barrister, whether she's working in her translation work, her campaigning work, she brings an absolute determination to that work to see a better world for everyone. Um, and then a great deal of wit and humor. Um, I've just been looking at the internal chat that we have amongst the panelists, just making sure we're all staying on time. And um, a couple of people going, yes, I remember receiving that text message from Alice 
Allison. Um, and I know a few people um, were involved with that when um, Ian was first hatching his ideas with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, and I think uh, for every single one of you, um, the story of what those portraits represent is really quite extraordinary um, to have uh, Zahir's portrait, to have Pinar's portrait, to have Shauki's portrait, um, and to have Deborah's portrait um, on the walls of the Royal Society of Edinburgh at this moment in history, as the Royal Society too begins to ask the questions it needs to ask of what its um, involvement might have been historically within, um, within the slave trade and within imperialism and begins to um, take forward a project to go through its archives and its records and understand its own place within that, not to rush in and decide it was definitely all good as some institutions have done, or to rush in and say it was definitely all bad, but to do what education needs as Deborah is saying, to take time, to take stock, to be careful and to discover through education what it is that needs to be done. So Deborah, thank you very much. Can you just re remind me of the, the number of the bill? It was P3222, is that right? PP stands for Public Petition 3222. There you go, everybody, everybody keep an eye on that. Thank you, Deborah. thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to our final panelists before we move to a Q&A session. Um, and I'll obviously also be bringing in some, some questions with, with Ian and his work as well. Um, but I'd now like to move to the University of Mosul um, and to Dr. Allah Hamdan and to thank Allah for um, securing some extra data to help with your connection. I'm really hoping that this is gonna work well for you. Um, but um, Allah is director of the Remote Sensing Center at the University of Mosul. He's also senior lecturer in structural geology and remote sensing at that university. He's a member of various councils and committees, including leadership of Iraqi Geologists Union, Arab Stag, ICOMOS, and Iraqi National Committee of Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Allah, it's lovely to see you and also your beautiful portrait picture of Istanbul, which I'm getting used to seeing behind you. Um, it's over to you for a talk of around seven minutes. Yes, thank you, Alison. It's lovely to see you too, always. And I can I can send you the poster if you if you would like. Uh, thank you, uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh. Thank you, Young Academy of Scotland. Uh, thank you, Alison. Thank you, Ian Campbell, for this wonderful uh, uh, webinar and thanks for everyone organizing this webinar. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Allah Hamdun. I am uh, director of Remote Sensing Center in Mosul University. I am in Mosul now in Iraq. I'm talking to you from Mosul. Um, my story started in, uh, in June 2014 when ISIS took over of my city in Mosul and I had to leave uh, with one bag and no destination, no plan, um, nothing at all planned for anything, no future, mysterious futures. So I, I had to leave and I went to Turkey. I stayed in Turkey for a few months without money and without uh, help or support. I sometimes I slept in, in gardens, um, uh, trouble and difficulties to survive there in Turkey. And then I, uh, some, some of my colleagues told me about CARA, Council of Atresk Academics and Scholar Atresk in America. And I applied uh, for fellowship for CARA and luckily they accepted my, my, uh, my fellowship and uh, they start to help me. And that was a wonderful time for me because luckily, finally, I, I found some help from, from CARA. And they found me a post-doctorate fellowship, research fellowship in Aberdeen University. And I moved in, in January 2015 to, Aber, uh, to Aberdeen. And that was wonderful for me because it's like a big save. And it's like there is a hope in the life. And I see a light in the, in the end of the dark tunnel. 
in the beginning, I, I struggled to, to, to adjust myself in Aberdeen. It's different weather, different culture, different community. Uh, it was really difficult for me. But later when I made a lot of friends and Aberdeen University helped me so much, uh, I started to like Aberdeen so much and I started to like the community. And I loved Aberdeen and I still do love Aberdeen. Aberdeen has special okay. Um, and then unfortunately my fellowship has ended in, in August uh, 2016. Then I had to, to move to Ireland for another fellowship in Maynooth University. Um, for a few months I I was I was in big confusion uh, whether whether I have to go back to Erbil. Uh, to my family because my family been alone there in a refugee camp and help my community whether I have to stay in Ireland and start my life and I have to be selfish and think about myself. I was so confusing at that time and I, I, I fight myself for months for a few months for that. That was really hard decision to make. And then I made a decision. Then I back to Erbil and help my family uh, in the refugee camp. And then I checked from the out from refugee camp. And also I made a small team to help people in refugee lost in Erbil and Kirkuk. And I helped my university to back again, to raise again. And uh, in uh, March, 2017, I, uh, I raised a campaign. It's called Mosul Book Bridge uh, campaign to rebuild the library, which has been distracted by ISIS in 2015 and 2016. This library was a really big library, more than 1 million books being destroyed and burned. But uh, I raised this uh, campaign, national campaign, with help with colleague uh, Carolyn Sanders, Kate Walker, and Alice Koenig, and with help with, uh, from uh, Young Academy of Scotland and Book Aid International. So um, I raised that campaign to support that library. Um, I'm still. Uh, trying to do my best to make a, uh, some um, partnership between Muslim University and British uh, or European University or anywhere. In 2016, when I back uh, to Iraq, I don't know whether it was wrong decision or right decision, but I, I like to help people. I, I, I will help people anywhere in my city, in, in my community, or anywhere in, in the place. I would like to, I would like to thank Aberdeen University and Aberdeen, and I would like to thank uh, Cara for their help, wonderful help, and I would like to thank Scholar at Risk as well. I would like to thank Royal Society of Edinburgh, and I would like to thank Young Academy of Scotland when they accepted my membership. They helped me a lot and they supported me a lot during my time. Um, I would like to thank everyone who supported me in my dark time when I was helpless and targetless. Um, I, at the end, thank you for that really wonderful portrait. That's meant so much to me. I appreciate it for. Ian. And thanks for everyone and thanks for Alison for talk and give me a time. I really appreciate that for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Allah. And that was bang on time with my little phone going off telling me that's the, the perfect timing. Um, I just um, want to um, I want to thank you, Allah, for those really moving words. Um, and I think we're all struck by the ways in which you have spoken of the struggles and the wrestling with yourself, you know, your own future, your own career, your own safety, and then your decision to return to Mosul and to Erbil and to your family and to support that and the things that you've done, not least with the book bridge, which is just such a brilliant thing for a structural geologist um, of remote sensing to be doing. I can almost see Ian an artwork of a book bridge. I know you paint portraits, but I have a feeling there might be something there that could could be done with your imagination. But something just so um, so so touching about the the genuine humility in your voice when you speak of wanting to help people. Um, I think we all hear it, we all feel it, and. 
um, that you too are aware, and I think we are all aware that every single one of our speakers has said again and again how much they have been helped, how grateful they are, and how much they want to help, but not just that they want to help, how much they do that is helping so many, not least being present yet again on a panel, talking about their work, the portrait, their story, the things that are hard to speak about. And if I might also say, all speaking in, a, in English, which is a language which is not your first language, possibly not even your second language, um, and doing so with a poetry of phrasing, um, a, a, a dignity and a sense of discipline that is very inspiring to all of us. So again, Allah, thank you so much and for securing that additional data as well. Um, I'm sure you, you all have many, many thoughts at the moment and I've just been looking through the chat and mostly people are just saying, I am so inspired by today's speakers. Thank you, says Sophie. Um, Chris says, thank you to all speakers for your inspiring and moving words. Really pleased that you've all been honored in this way. Um, thank you. Ah, oh, there's Carly. Hi, Carly. It's lovely to know you're online. Carly, for those of you who don't know, was the brainchild behind the Yas Ara scheme. So it's just lovely that you've been able to tune in, I think, from, from um, Canada, from Nova Scotia. Um, so thank you so much for what you did and the work you did at that time. Um, some other great people just online saying thank you to everyone for this great event. Sheila Mills, who has been the coordinator for much of this and particularly for the CARA At-Risk Academics Network in Scotland. And she's just put her um, email in there. I know a few of you have been saying, how do we get in touch? Might there be a way we too could be supported? Um, her email is in there in the chat, mills at cara.ngo. So again, Sheila, lovely to know that you're online and thank you so much for all that you've done over the last um, a few years um, just to really develop this scheme in Scotland um, with CARA, with the Royal Society of Edinburgh um, and with um, the network of universities around the country. Um, a, a, a number of you also just pointing to the lived experience of refugees and asylum seekers um, in the city, Salah Hadan, um, just thanking you, um, Dr. Shalki, for helping Yemenis in Glasgow. Um, just saying that you need this and you need all the cooperation, but thanking you for what you've done there. Um, and Mohammed, um, uh, as an asylum seeker from Sierra Leone, who's been in Tartan Lodge, um, one of the hotels that Pina, hotels in inverted commas that Pinar has been speaking of. Um, he's saying he has been in the legal profession since 2015 as a community paralegal and legal researcher and dreams of becoming a lawyer. So if anybody out there or anybody in the Royal Society of Edinburgh has um, any support or help for Mohammed? I think he would love to know a bit more about how that might be possible. And a few people just pointing to the fact that, uh, uh, to, to the ways in which um, Pinar and Schalke have been describing the situation in Scotland um, uh, around the, the plight of asylum seekers, but also Deborah's really moving words, um, which I think stand very well with Zaha's words um, about the situation of welcome in Scotland, yes, but also the continuing issue of racism within um, Scottish society. And I think we all heard your words, Deborah, when you said, yeah, if there's racism in a society, if something's not wrong, if something's wrong, then we have to do something. So again, thank you, says Rona, Rona Alexander, for challenging the complacency, which we risk falling into as Scots, thinking everything is so much better north of the border. There's so much ignorance to challenge. Um, and I'd bring at that point also the words of my team of um, Tawana Sutoli, Gamali Todro, who are artists in residence with me, with the UNESCO chair, who speak a lot about the situation um, in Scotland, and, um, but also in their own country saying, there's always prejudice, there's always intolerance. We always have to be working through education to find a better route for all of us. Um, but before I um, ask um, some of the questions that I'd love to um, see ask, uh, um, asked, I'm wondering um, if we might just pick up on lots of people just feeling really inspired by this, lots of people sharing links in the chat. 
um, about places and inspiring stories that there are. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to come back to the portraits, which is how really this came about. And um, we've heard a little bit from Deborah already about her experience of the portraits. Um, but maybe to um, ask um, you, Zahir, um, what what you thought. Um, you know, Deborah's just been um, describing what she thought when she when she heard about this. Maybe to ask you for your kind of thoughts about this when Ian got in touch. Uh, so yeah, so like I basically when when they were speaking about it, I thought it would be kind of you know the kind of very small small like photos I can just have it on a table or something like that like kind of a very small picture but when 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 they were saying a portrait I didn't know what portrait me meant at that moment so I had to google it and then find it but like when 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 I saw it really that is big huge picture on the wall I was like oh no that is that is that is not real and and the fact that I and managed to get to get it like yeah it's exact I, I I didn't believe that was painted at, at the moment I thought I thought it was like it was like printed out or it was it was made like that but when it was started I didn't believe that was going in that way and I still don't believe it it is it is still there I still don't believe that there is too much there's so much of of that that support that we have been having right here and we have been kind of featured in that way. It's really, really special. Think that you will have for like for the rest of your life, and that is going to be really special. Thing. Okay, when I have, I, when I grow up and have say grand grandchildren, I'll say, look, I've got a portrait posted there. What have you got? So kind of. So thank you very much for that. And 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 still don't believe it honestly. I still I feel I'm a very very big dream. And I am really worried about waking up. Thank you. Thank you, Zaha. That's a lovely way of putting it. I also love, um, I mean, the po each portrait, I think, as Deborah was saying, has a really distinctive quality where Ian, I think, has captured something of your soul. And I just love the way there's a, there's a light in your eyes as you're looking and smiling that seems to capture that, that real tenderness and generosity of spirit that you have in, in the portrait. Pina, I'm wondering if I might come to you next. And if you want to unmute your mic. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my connection is not that great. What was the question again? Yeah, just what did you think? Yeah, so what did you think when you got the text message and um, you were starting to think in the way that Deborah was also describing about having a portrait at the Royal Society of Edinburgh? I think, it, yeah, the initial reaction was um, Alison wants something again. What is it that this time that we're going to create and shake up different platforms? So I think that was my first initial reaction. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's the fact that, you know, there has been an opportunity to create it, to have different faces and different stories from all across the world to come together and to show that we are here now and we are part of the community and society. And these are our stories. I think it was... It was just, yeah, kind of similar to what Zahir had said, kind of unreal and really different as well. I mean, seeing your portrait on the wall, it's like, what's going on here? Who's this? Um, and the aspect that Ian really captured our personalities and stories within the portraits, um, especially with mine, there is um, Swallows in the background which is a project that I'm working on for a book for children about migration. So the fact that he covered that and reflected that. And I didn't even notice until my sister pointed out saying, oh, have you noticed this? Like, I was like, oh, wow. Um, so each portrait I think reflects our personality, the work we do and our sense of humor and who we are. And it's, it is something different, I would say. And it is good that platforms like um, Royal Society of Edinburgh is um, encouraging everyone to come together and to show that um, like I said, th there are different people from different professions. And I think one thing that I have noticed is the stories that we all have, the different reasons why we were, we moved from the countries, why some of us from, you know, persecution op operation from different uh, types of um, yeah, reasons and movement. And I think that's just amazing that uh, we have this platform to explain about that and raise the awareness. Um, and 
reaching out to the communities, I think, is really important. And that's one thing we were talking with Ian and with everyone about how do we create the dialogue at different platforms and raise the story in a creative way, not just through um, typical ways of like a panel or a workshop, but also using portraits and images to raise um, issues around migration and the work that we do. I could talk forever, so I'm not going to talk forever. I probably should pass to someone else. I'll pass it back to you, Alison. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Pina. Thank you. And um, I think everyone's getting a bit of a sense of, of, of um, dreading getting messages from me, from my colleagues and friends within the city. Um, but I do, um, I, I do think, you know, at the moment we've got these living portraits um, and, and the portrait artist um, with them. Um, and um, I, I'm going to pass to Schalke and then on to Deborah just to speak a little about what it felt like to suddenly realise there was the opportunity, not for you to be painted on your own, but for you to be painted together as a, as a, as a community of scholars and a collective within the fellowship. So Schalke, do you want to just say what it felt like getting that message? I mean, to be honest, that it is, I mean, special story. I mean, uh, there's two stories. Now we have uh, individual stories and the portrait is, is, is a different story for us because we will be inside of rural society and we are part of uh, who can change in the future. So it, I mean, it is special story for us. And I appreciate about that. To be honest, I didn't know what the meaning of that portrait when I started. As you say, Muhammad, I mean, exactly that time. I don't know what's, what's that, I mean, portrait. But when I understood what, I said, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and uh, my son also, when um, he, uh, he had seen that, uh, I mean, that portrait, he said, yeah, this man like you, that, <laughs> said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> really, so... <laughs> To be honest, as I said, I mean, that's great things and good idea. And uh, thank you for that. And I will leave, I mean, I will uh, take uh, Deborah to speak more than that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shauki. That's lovely. I love the humor that all of your children, um, Zaha and Deborah and Allah and Shauki, that they're bringing um to this um and and ian that you were talking about painting um your own your own children ian do you want to just say a couple of words about you know what, what it's like for you hearing um our living portraits speaking about that experience of being painted by you and and maybe also something about that that the background that pinar was speaking about yeah um do you know it's always really interesting hearing uh what it's like for the people who have been who I've painted to see the painting. Um, a, a lot of people uh, find that it's, it's similar to the experience of hearing your, a, an audio recording of your voice for the first time. It's just a little bit weird. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it, it, does, it does fascinate me. And, and there, there's, there's this kind of, there will always be, I suppose, uh, this relationship with this building, with these, the uh, your face on the wall, um, what a, what a strange thing. Um, with the uh, with the, the first three portraits uh, that I painted in the set uh, with Deborah Pinar and Zahir, I, I kind of I thought of those as a, as a set of three together, and then with Alan Shauki um, as as a, they were they were kind of painted as a, a unit as well, and in the background of Pinar's and Deborah's and, and Zahir's, there's uh, I, I had little elements from uh, from their stories and the conversations that I had with them that became um, slightly symbolic in the background. And Deborah talked a, a lot about. Um, the, the kind of jigsaw pieces of our life fitting together. Uh, and, and there ended up being all these jigsaw pieces subtly in the background. Uh, and Pinar had talked a lot about uh, these swallows, uh, which has, has always been a symbol of migration and travel. Um, it's apparently it's one of the most common tattoos to have in the world. Uh, lots of sailors who've traveled all over the world will have swallows tattooed 
Um, and the conversation that I had with Zahir, um, I, there was a number of elements that really um, struck me that he was talking about. The one thing he talked about was uh, having to walk past a street with snipers in it on a, on a daily basis. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that's, that's not something that I've had to experience in my life. Uh, and nobody would want anyone else to ex experience that. But hearing his story, um, uh, there's, there's these um, traveling lines uh, in the background that, that I, I had in mind, particularly this daily experience of, uh, of having to endure going past the, uh, these parts of the city with, with snipers in. Um, uh, but I, I think it's always going to uh, be a little bit special for me traveling into Edinburgh now to know that I could walk into that building uh, and see all your faces again. Um, and it's, it's interesting, I, I've done self-portraits uh, quite a lot over the years, and I find it curious. Uh, there, there's a portrait I did just four or five years ago uh, when I was turning 40, uh, and I look at it now and, the, oh, my beard's gone really white now. Oh, um, And it's, I think you'll find it interesting over the years just to look at that and, and you see this face, and, and, and it's, a, it's a point in time. Uh, and. A, a reminder of why this happened and, and who you were at that point in your life. Uh, you know, none of our lives are static. Thanks so much, Ian. And I'm just watching, um, the, just watching the living faces that are a little older than they were when they were put on the wall, um, just smiling and laughing and just noticing the rapport that you've all built up between yourselves, that sense of relationship and, you know, the, the, the tenderness that's there within this at the moment. I'm wondering, Deborah, um, I mean, you've spoken quite a bit, Deborah, about um, the portrait, not just as a portrait, but as a symbol, what it represents, mm -hmm. but also that it's been, if you like, uh, it's opened up things to you that you weren't expecting. Um, and maybe you wondered if you wanted to say something about what it means in that respect, particularly the way you've been honoured by, by your, your original country. Yeah, um, I think, well, as I said initially, I did not want Ian to do a portrait of Deborah KMB. I wanted Ian to pass a message that I wanted to send to the public. And the message was that many Africans left their home to an unexpected journey. The reason why they leave and they go is to find peace and tranquility, that's all. But in throughout the journey, you face unbelievable story, hardship, you face you know, this is why Ian always, he does say it very politely. He said, Deborah God went through things and you're gonna make people to know more about him. When, more about her, when my portrait reached the Congo, many of the people knew me who said, Deborah, you're a beautiful woman. This woman is late, she, she's not beautiful. She's ugly. That's not you. She's completely ugly. That's not you. And I, I know, and then after they finished making those comments, they said, well, you know, you write, our African journey is the hardship, is the difficulties, and whatever things that we, try, we, we go through, we still stand tall in dignity. So you guys need to understand this. This is this, what you have at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and I'm, I'm glad the Royal Society of Edinburgh is here. You have a pure diamond in your hole, the portrait of Deborah Kayembe, not Deborah Kayembe, but the portrait because the portrait symbolize the history of all migrants professionally as human, human being, the resources, the capacities, the no, 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 and the yes, we still stand, yes, we can. That is that portrait. And Ian represented it beautifully. Just try an exercise. Get that portrait to the to New York there, where, where they, they, they evaluated price of portrait, and you realize the pure diamond that you made yourself in those places. London doesn't have it. You have it because he has made such change in my life. Because he has put me in places that I could never even imagine. I imagine the artist beyond the portrait is just as amazing that the portrait he has been done. 
you know, my children, when they look at this portrait, they say, it's you, but you do this, do that, do this, do that, because it's how I raise my children. But it's not about what I want to say here. Ian has done a fantastic job on this portrait. And the fantastic job he has done is that the African journey to Europe or to Scotland is not a simple or easy journey. And every single migrant coming in this country is trying to rebuild the country and make the life together, trying to put the lives together. But whatever we go through, because I've gone through the same thing that Alan will go, Alan went through, the same, not as Zaire, but Zaire, who bomb under me, not that one. I've been nearby, but not that one. You know, I've been in places where my profession was not accepted, not respected, and they were asked me to, re to re restart again. And today I am praised for my work. Why? Because I stand in dignity, the dignity that that portrait shows. And Ian has made it, he has made it. And the RIC has to have conscience of these five portraits they have showing the history of humankind, the journey, separate journey of human being, leaving their home and choosing the new place to start, but this time in dignity. Deborah. Deborah, thank you so much. I think you've, you've summarized what many of us have felt seeing the portraits um, really beautifully. And I'm, I'm going to come to Allah um, last to let him reflect on, on this as well. But also just, um, I remember um, Ian, when he was talking to me about these ideas, um, saying, you know, the most painted person in the world is the queen. Um, and um, what would it mean for people who never imagine having a portrait painted um, to be painted? And um, I think, you know, Deborah and Zahir and Allah and Shauki and Pinar have all spoken about the fact that, and, and Ian as well, about the fact that the Royal Society of Edinburgh is a place where we hang our, we, we, we place on the walls our Nobel Prize winners um, and people who have been great intellectual scholars and contributors to society, um, where we see them on the basis of the work that they've produced rather than the journey is that they have taken to be able to be part of that and in a way whilst those um, portraits are really significant and important because of that work it's a wonderful thing to see an academy choose to honor in a similar way these singular journeys these particular journeys of dignity tenacity courage charity um, and and intellect sheer creative intellect um, each story very different, each to be told in its own time, in its own way, with its own dignity. But to have those to sit alongside um, what it represents to be a Nobel Prize winner or to have been a, a founding figure in the Scottish Enlightenment. But I'm going to come to you, Allah. Um, you, I know, are outside of the UK at the moment um, and just um, let you also reflect back um, as one of the people in the chat has been saying, Robert um, McNeil, who I think is also the portrait artist, Robert McNeil, who's also done work on Srebrenica. It's lovely to see you here in the chat as well, Robert. But um, he, he's saying how nice it is hearing back collectively from all those who sat for the portraits. So Allah, maybe if you want to give us your last thoughts on this. Thank you, Alison. Um... It was great uh, to be painted by Ian Campbell. Uh, it was a big challenge for uh, for Ian to paint me because, I, I, as you said, I was outside of UK and Iraq, and it was really big challenge how we can meet. Luckily, we make a really long plan for that for many days. Where you'll be, and we arranged that to meet in Liverpool. And thank you for that, Ian. That's, thank you for your trip from Glasgow to Liverpool. It was really great uh, to meet you there. Um, this portrait, I, I I would like to call it books because it is it is a story. It's books. Each portrait has a story. Um, one day while I was in Aberdeen, I, I had a friend. He said, "How people they will remember your story? What what you struggle? What you faced?" That is what question was really hard for me. I said, maybe by a few days, I would be forgotten, me and many people like me. 
but this idea is, is brought this box. Uh, so each portrait has a story. So people will even stand in front of each portrait, they will ask about their story. So they will know about the story. So as my colleagues say, it's like symbols. Um, it's like a box for stories. Um, first time when I came to Edinburgh and I have seen, and I met you, Alison, there, when I have seen my portrait hanging on the wall, I couldn't believe it. This is first time for me, someone paint me. And I see my, my portrait in front of me. And even people, they were looking at it. It was really wonderful work. And it's, it's mean, it's mean uh, a lot of them just portrait. As I said, it's, it's the book for a story for everyone, for every sufferer, every struggle for refugee in the world. So thank you for everyone organizing that. And thanks you for Ian Campbell. And thanks for real sight of Adam Brandy and Kadok Scotland. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allah. And, and thank you to all of you. Um, we're coming to the end of our time now, but I, I don't know about you, but I've certainly felt very moved by listening to all of our scholars speaking and telling their stories all so different, so distinctive, all doing such different things from structural geology and book bridges to pharmacology to digital technology to human rights activism and active inquiry and work on theatres and integration and with all the, the, the horrific situation with destitution in the city of Glasgow and then campaigning against racism and for a better curriculum in Scotland. I think every single one of um, those of uh, those who have been listening and um, will agree that you are an absolute credit to your families, to the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Young Academy of Scotland and to Scottish society. Um, and we are extremely lucky to have you. And I feel extremely lucky to count you as colleagues and as friends. Um, but also to say the same of Ian Campbell, I think um, I've known Ian now for many years and I know that he comes at the question of portrait painting from a very different angle to that of a classically trained artist. Um, he understands it as a way of, I think maybe using Deborah's terms, capturing the story of human dignity that might be concentrated or or instantiated in a, in a human being, allowing portraits to do some of the work of raising um, awareness of stories, but telling it in a different way, telling it in a way that can open out a very different space to the quite fraught space of accusation and of anger that we find in the public domain. Graham Kai in the chat says there is so much talent, not to mention experience amongst New Scots. How can we help them secure positions which will use this talent? And I think this panel, these scholars, this work are all examples of how art can work in its many different forms to open out avenues. How CARA and at-risk academics, how, the, how YAS and the Royal Society of Edinburgh can use their convening power to open a space, yes, for the important intellectual contributions of our panelists, but also for understanding those human stories, the ones that always are in the acknowledgements of books, but actually are as significant as everything else. Just to say, as I'm closing off, um, to thank Nazia Khan and Hannah Bentley and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Nikki Moran, um, um, uh, Kylie Kehoe, who I know has been online, and many others who have been mentoring our scholars as well, just to thank you for your energy, your tenacity, and your creative thinking, and the way that you two have found um, a, a way of now making this normal rather than unusual, that this kind of work and this kind of panel might happen. Quite a few of you um, have asked for some information and I know that Nazia and Pinar and Deborah and others have been posting links as have I in the chat and we can maybe consolidate those perhaps on a blog post in future. You might want to have a look at Pinar's blog about this today. You might want to read the Herald article um, about this event and about Ian's work and our um, many different um, sitters here. Um, uh, they didn't know they were sitters before they had their portraits painted. Um, and to just say that we are um, recording this, as you know, it's been live on YouTube and it will be available on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's YouTube channel very soon. But I'm actually going to finish um, and say goodbye with a very short um, poem written by my colleague and, um, and um, poet 
uh, Tawana Sitoli, who has also had the dubious honour of sitting for Ian Campbell um, at the Solas Festival a few years ago. And I'm just going to read this poem because I think it can be dedicated in this moment to all of you, to Ian, to Shauki, to Allah, to Mohammed, to Deborah and to Pinar. Who shouted daybreak in the middle of the night? That was just me, daydreaming in darkness. But when I'm awake, I see shadows of silhouettes training for occupation. It was not real work and it was not really working. Yet words so convincing, looks so convincing. If seeing is believing, then I disagree with my eyes. Who shouted liberty in the middle of oppression? That was just me, Deborah, Pinar, Zaha, Shauki, Allah, Ian, daydreaming in darkness. But when I'm awake, I see mixed messages from the mixed up messenger and speeches lengthening and lessons lessening, yet words so convincing, looks so convincing. If seeing is believing, then I disagree with my eyes. Who called for celebration in the middle of misery? That was just me again, yet again, daydreaming in darkness. But when I'm awake, I see nothing. Nothing but things hot off the press that make the blood run cold. I see ignorance sitting pretty and wisdom sitting lonely. Yet words so convincing, looks so convincing. If seeing is believing, I disagree with my eyes. Ian, thank you for helping us see to believe. And to each of you, Zaha, Shauki, Allah, Deborah and Pinar, thank you for sitting patiently um, as wise members of our society and bringing what you do to the work of human dignity. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming and joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>